So hi, um, this is topic 9.3. We're looking at market mix. So I believe in class we got to this, but you know maybe it's a good idea to just uh, that you know that seemed like a month ago, even though it was just a week ago. Um, but anyhow, the four factors that um, that uh, identify through market research it provides a uh, designer with uh, the accurate brief and market requirements. So remember the four P's: product, place price and promotion, okay? And you can watch this video again uh, to remind yourself of, of what's happening with those things. Okay, so um, I think we got to this also, right? Uh, and and this, this is important, like whenever you're, you're thinking about a product, you know, it comes down to the fact that, that you're, you are satisfying some need, right? Um, you may be doing some incremental changes. So like what features does it have that, that it meets these needs? What does it look like? How is it differentiated versus your competitors? And, and then um, can your product be trusted? This is a, an interesting idea. Um, we'll talk about something called standardization with that. Okay, so you know these are things to consider whenever you're thinking about bringing a product to market, right? So, um, yep. You know, if, if you're not satisfying a need, then you, you probably don't need a product. You know, uh, if it doesn't have features that meet the needs that you've identified, then you probably don't need that product. You know, what does it look like? Is it attractive or not? You know, is it something that people like or, or don't like? And then how is it different versus your competitors, right? If you have the exact same product of your competitors, you should really shouldn't be, you know, what's the point of getting a, uh, another product? And then, yeah, can your product be trusted? Okay, so one thing that, that they make a big deal about in here is this idea of standardization. And, you know, I know this just seems like a no-brainer, but for really, for much of human history, nothing was standardized. When we started watching this video, I think this is where we ended up in the last class, but, you know, they were talking about how there's, you know, there were, I forget how many different measurement systems in France alone. It was like a quarter of a million or something like that. It was ridiculous, right? You know, people just didn't have a standardized system, and that, that causes havoc when you're trying to trade. So, um, you know, watch this video again. It's, it's actually pretty interesting um, how, how uh, the metric system was, you know, born, and it, uh, it, it now is adopted by most of the world. There's only three countries, I think, that don't use the, the metric system. Okay, so then uh, let's look at market mix, right? Let's look at uh, product standardization again. So... The government standards uh, for for particular market segments. So this this right here, I think it's about um, milk in in the Netherlands. But basically, they're following European rules for for standardizing their product, right? And if you see this symbol on something, the CE or or um, the CE and the star, this means that it that it conforms, right? So it's European conformity. So basically, it conforms to to EU standards, which are which are some of the most um, strict in the world. So if you see that, that means that product is likely a very nice product. Okay. Um, so one of the ways that we can standardize things is, is component standardization, standardization, right? And an example of that would be um, a USB plug, but they are all the same. Um, you know, something not standard, and this is, you know, something kind of interesting is uh, electrical outlets around the world. I mean, if if you wonder why, why don't we just have one standard outlet through the entire world? Well, it basically came down to the fact that until relatively recently, no one traveled with anything that they needed to plug in. Like, you know, before, you're, before you had a cell phone and an iPad and those kinds of things like, or laptops, you know, if you were to travel to say, I don't know, you're going from, um, you know, Australia to uh, the UK, you wouldn't bring anything to plug in. Like, it's not like you're going to bring a lamp, you know, from Australia to the UK and, and plug it in. So, you know, this is like an Australian plug down here. This is a UK plug. It wasn't an issue until we started carrying devices that needed to be charged. Uh, so now there's talk of, of trying to standard, standardize electrical outlets. Um, but that's, you know, basically the reason why outlets are not standard throughout the, uh, throughout the world. Um, this is a, a basically a, um, a video that shows why uh, or how this whole idea of standardization came in. Like, you know, before this guy, Eli Whitney, was, was um, standardizing muskets, they were all made individually and you couldn't interchange parts. So that's a huge problem. 
right? And that's the component standardization. You want to be able to exchange parts with other things, you know? Um, if, if you're using the same kind of screws on something, then you can always use that same kind of screw. Um, it, it's, it's standard with all the, you know. So yeah, component standardization is important. Okay, here we go. Let's move on to something else. All right, industry-wide standards. So for instance, you know, like shipping. When you look at this, it's, it's how, how uh, containers changed the world. It really did. So, you know, these are industry standards. You have, you know, a 40-foot, a 20-foot, but you have these containers that are standard throughout the world. And then same with things like this. Same with things like, like bolts and screws and things like that. They're, they're standard. You, you get, the, you know, things like the M4, M5, and, and uh, the number of millimeters and, and that kind of thing. And that allows you to make sure that you have um, an industry-wide standard that you can use. Okay, types of products that we need to consider. Um, here's one that, that we should consider. It's called a trigger product. And this is a product that somebody buys to satisfy a need. You know, again, a classic example is something like a, a cell phone uh, or a smartphone, right? They, they satisfy a person's need. This is different from what we call an incremental product. So these are add-ons. Right. So, you know, like a phone case for a, a cell phone. Well, you know, the thing about an incremental product is you would never buy this unless you actually had a cell phone. Like this is not something that you're going to buy by itself just to have. You would buy it because you have the cell phone, not the other way around. OK, so an incremental product is, is something that you buy that that makes your product. I don't know the product that your trigger product better. All right. Place places where the product is sold and that it's convenient for the customer. Okay, so there's a couple of places that we want you to consider. One of them is brick and mortar stores. So brick and mortar stores, you know, it literally comes from this stuff right here. These red things right here are bricks. The gray stuff in the middle is mortar, and that's what holds the bricks together. And a brick and mortar store is a, is a, a traditional store. You know, it's like Tamimi. You go into Tamimi, you can shop and buy whatever you want, right? Um, so it's an actual store that actually exists in physical space that you can go to and purchase items. Okay, so that is a brick and mortar store. store. And these are very convenient because you can, you know, if it comes back to that whole uh, Rogers, um, uh, you know, how, uh, adopting th uh, innovation, like things like observability and trialability, right? Like in a brick and mortar store, you can actually hold a cell phone. You can actually you know, look at it and, and touch it. And that's, that's something that's important for, you know, for instance, an Apple store it allows you to get that trial ability in there. Okay. There's advantages to brick and mortar stores, right? You can touch, see, try things in real life. Uh, you can find similar products nearby. Um, the problem is, you know, things like commuting to the store and finding parking, the higher prices stores, uh, you know, they have a higher overhead. It's called overhead. And that's things like rent and heating and light and, you know, paying the employees, all that stuff. And then there's the, the of course, the travel to and from shopping. So those are some of the disadvantages of having a brick and mortar store. You can also have online, right? So online is, you know, like Amazon or uh, Desert Cart or Souk or whatever, whatever you used to shop online. Um, it's convenient. You can shop from anywhere, right? You don't actually have to go there. Um, it could be lower prices, not necessarily, but it could be lower prices. Disadvantages is that, you know, shipping time, you don't get things instantaneous. The nice thing about a brick and mortar store is you walk in and you walk out with the product. Uh, but uh, when you shop online, there's there's shipping time and, and costs that, that are doing that. Um, returning it, if, you, if there's a problem um, that it isn't what you expected, and this again gets back to that whole idea of trialability, um, you would you would not be able to return it as easy. And then often there's costs incurred for, for returns. That means they charge you money to return things sometimes. Okay. So there's hybrid stores. So a lot of shops are actually going to the uh, hybrid model. So what they're doing is they are allowing people to shop uh, online. And then you can, you know, a couple of things. They, they'll ship to you. Or in some cases, they'll just have it ready for you. And you show up at the store and you just get your, your, um, your uh, stuff that you ordered. And they just put it in your car and you're ready to go, right? So like Target does that in the States. And then, you know, Amazon's starting to do that with something called Amazon Go. So, you know, it's, it's a hybrid. Hybrid usually means it's a mixture of two different things. So this is a hybrid between the online store and the brick-and-mortar store. Okay, price. Uh, 
price is super important to get right. So you need to set your price so that you can profit from it, but also that it's going to attract customers and not turn them off. And if you get this wrong, you will be out of business because nobody will buy something that's overpriced. And then they will also not, uh, um, you, you, if you don't price it well enough, you don't make any money and then you go out of business. So here we go. So a couple things to consider when we're pricing things. We want the, uh, the idea of cost plus pricing. Okay. That's, uh, that's where a company adds a percentage of the total cost of a product to its product margin. So an example of this would be, you know, if, if uh, the total cost of a product is $500 and you want to make 10% product uh, profit, then you would charge $550 for that. So that cost plus pricing is this 10% profit that you're building into the, uh, the price of the product. Okay, demand pricing. So demand pricing, uh, they, you know, companies will set the price according to the demand for the product. So this is, you know, classic um, supply and demand stuff that you might be learning about in economics. So, you know, if, if, a, if there's a huge demand for a product, then you're going to have a higher price. If there's less demand, you're going to have a lower price. Um, and the initial price may be high to maximize profits. You know, uh, iPhones or gaming consoles, these start out high because everybody wants the new one. And then as time passes, they become, you know, cheaper or, you know, something else comes out and you're like, oh, I don't want a PS4. I want a PS, I don't know. I don't play video games, guys, so I'm sorry about this, but I want a PS5. And I know that doesn't exist and you're laughing at me now. Anyhow, um, you know, you get the idea. Okay. Competitor pricing. So companies sometimes uh, price their products uh, based on the price of, of the competitors, right? So um, they may price it below the same or higher, okay? Sometimes what they try to do is um, they, they might add extra features for the same price to try to attract market share, or they might undercut, the, uh, undercut their competitors. So this is what, you, what you're trying to do is corner the market share to make sure that you are the only one selling that product. Amazon is classic for this. So if Amazon, if you have an online store on Amazon and they notice that your product is selling well, what they'll do is they'll, they'll start selling that product at a lower price than you are offering it at. And basically they drive you out of business doing that. And Amazon's kind of a, I mean, it's a great company, but it's also kind of evil in a lot of ways. And that's one of the ways that Amazon undercuts its competitors. Basically it says like, Oh, I see you're selling that. Well, we're a big company. We can afford to take losses on it. We're going to undercut your prices so that you can't sell that uh, item anymore. And then, then we'll be the only place that, that uh, sells it. Okay. Product line pricing. So this is where um, companies set different prices for different products within a product line. So you know you have a price for a basic model, and then the next uh, product up is, has more features, has better quality. It would be a higher price, and so on down the line. And uh, you know I kind of think of, of things like airline classes. You know, like you have you know standard economy, and then premium economy, and then you've got business class, and then you've got blah 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 blah. And then you know there's actually gradations between all of those things. Um, you know, one class of flight won't let you earn as many miles as a different class of flight. So it's, it's, uh, airlines are, are a bit like that, but you could look at this as cars, you know, a car will have a basic model. And then as you add features, it's going to, uh, bring up the price. All right. Psychological pricing. So companies will also set prices so they, they make you feel like you're paying less, right? So they'll, they'll, they'll say, okay, this 99 is classic, right? They're going to say, oh, it's just 45.99 as opposed to $46. It might as well be $46. But in your mind, for some reason, it's, it sticks at 45. And, you know, a, a classic thing on this would be if you're selling something at, at $999.99. You know, that, that seems less expensive to people than 1000 even though it might as well be the same. Okay, promotion. So when we're looking at promotion, what we're doing is communicating information about a product uh, to consumers. So one way to do this is advertising. So you might advertise on um, either audio, visual, uh, so some sort of market communication. Publicity, right? So this is giving out information about the, the product, right? So um, it's, again, it's a bit like advertising, but you're going to be more, um, you know, giving more information about the product's you know, features and, um, and what it does. 
uh, personal selling. So this is where you could have, like, for instance, a door-to-door -door salesman, you know, somebody who goes door-to-door, -door, tries to sell a product, or maybe they're selling it in some sort of uh, market stall. Um, uh, oh, and I guess that's it. All right, well, thank you for watching.